Hi, church family. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm sharing this on Sunday, but if you're watching it on Wednesday, then hopefully you have just experienced some amazing weather that we've been waiting for for a long time. Hey, let me share some announcements with you. There's more than I want to share because we're getting close to Easter, but I'm going to try to do these real quickly. So we're having a church business meeting this coming Sunday, March 14th at 6 p.m., we do this annually. We celebrate uh, the things that God has done in the previous year, and we look ahead toward the next year and ministry opportunities and plans. And it's just always a really good opportunity to bring the church together and uh, and help us have unity in our vision and our mission. Uh, normally, we would have a big chicken dinner. We can't really do that now with COVID. So we're going to bring in a, a Der Dutchman pies, and we'd love to send one home with you and your family. So if you come, we'll send you home with a pie. If you watch it online, it'll be on YouTube. Um, you can swing over here between 7 and 8 that night, and we'll get you your pie. Please just email us at hilliardnaz at gmail.com and tell us what kind of a pie you want from Der Dutchman. We want to get that for you. Uh, next announcement, our Easter egg hunt is on Saturday, April the 3rd. Uh, we don't want to have a gigantic crowd. We want to be safe, and so we're offering it at three times, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. We'd like you to register on the website or Facebook, and if you're willing to donate some candy, um, that's individually wrapped can be put in an Easter egg. You could bring that with you over the next few Sundays. Uh, we have two ladies groups that will beginning will will be getting started pretty soon. Uh, easy for me to say. One is uh, called Jesus and Women. It looks like a really excellent study. I looked at that. It's uh, Saturdays at 11 a.m. led by Corey Sinclair. The other Armor of God by Jessica Dunmire. Uh, I'm sure will be a great study. That'll be Thursdays at 7 p.m. Um, you could email us, hilliardnaz at gmail.com, and, uh, and register. I want to mention the Bible reading plan for this coming week, 1 Corinthians chapters 10 through 16, and Psalms chapters 39 through 43. Let's keep reading together. God bless you. And then finally, tithes and offerings. Thank you for all of your support this past year. If you'd like to make a gift, you could do that on our website, or you could mail us a check. <sighs> and I'm done with the announcements, which makes me happy. Kurt is going to lead us in a song, uh, a song of praise to the Lord. And then I'm going to teach on a very interesting topic with Jeff McNichols and Cherie Evans. So uh, please join us for that. Let me have a prayer. Lord, it's good to be here today with our church family. I pray that you would encourage us and strengthen us and minister to us today in the name of Jesus. Well, good evening. It is good to be together again to worship the Lord we know that he sees our hearts and he longs for his worshipers to worship him in spirit and in truth. So this evening as we come, just open yourself to what God has for you, for the spoken word, and to empty out yourself as a sacrifice. Amen. hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again send me on fire send me on fire take all I have in these hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire, here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken, my heart sends in awe of your name, your mighty love stands strong to the end. You will fulfill your purpose in me. You won't forsake me. You will be with me. Here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life. Here I am. 
Jesus now Holding nothing back Holding nothing back I surrender Gracefully broken Singing all to Jesus now All to Jesus now We're holding nothing back We're holding nothing back We surrender We surrender, we surrender, we surrender. Father, we surrender our lives to you. May we be attentive, may we listen. We worship you, Father, for all of your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for all of your greatness. Amen. Hi, church family. Hey, it's great to be with you this evening. I'm here with, with uh, my good friends, Jeff and Cherie. We're talking about a passage from 1 Corinthians 6 and then a little bit from Psalm 32. And we're dealing with sexual sin. And so maybe an interesting topic for people to watch, but not the easiest topic for us to teach about. Uh, but, but an important topic. And so uh, most of you know us, but so I'm, I'm Pastor Kevin, uh, married with uh, two teenagers. And, uh, and then Jeff is a, a single man, um, part of the church here for a long time. And Cherie is a married woman with two daughters. And so Nadine wouldn't quite be a teen yet, or is she? Not quite. Okay, so her, her daughters are not teenagers. And so we feel like we've got some different perspectives to bring to this. Uh, we also have talked a lot about this ahead of time, so we, we're hoping we can convince our thoughts and, and that they can be helpful to you. But we're going to start with just uh, verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 6 and talk about this for a little bit. So verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So I'll share a couple of thoughts just to start with, but in our culture, people would ask the question, you know, what is sexual sin or why is sexual sin such a big deal? Because in our culture, so many people just don't think it's a big deal. Um, but our understanding of scripture is God has a very specific plan. Some people would criticize it and say that it's a narrow plan. I would want to defend God's plan and say that it's a really, really, really good plan. And so um, I would just explain it like this, that God's call is for a man and a woman um, to commit themselves to a lifetime of marriage and that sex is the most intimate physical act that we have, that we can experience. And it's God's plan that that act happens in the context of deep commitment, that, that vows are made, that um, till, you know, in sickness, in, in health and sickness till death do us part, um, that we give ourselves only to our spouse. And of course, that sounds absurd to, to the culture around us, but it's such an incredibly good plan that when we follow God's plan, I, I would also say God's plan is for a man and a woman to commit to themselves, to one another for a lifetime, but they, and sex is a part of that, and it's an important part, but the commitment is about loving God and loving one another and obviously, most of the time, sexual activity leads to children. 
And so that as parents, we would raise our children to love God as well, and that our home would be filled with love, that our home would be healthy and loving. We would raise our children, disciple our children. And, uh, and when we follow God's plan, it's beautiful. If, if we would consider for a moment, what if the whole world followed God's plan? And, and we think about all of the heartache and all of the pain. I, I could go through a, a huge list of, of things about the world that would be so much better. We wouldn't have an, a, an orphan crisis. We wouldn't deal with all of the, the, the deaths that have been caused as a result of age. There would be no sex trafficking. There would be no uh, victims of sexual abuse, on and on and on and on and on. If we all, so I just want to defend God's plan, that it's a really good plan. Um, but our culture would say that, that it's, it's a narrow plan. The other thing that I just want us to consider is when we step outside of God's plan, oftentimes we don't realize just how much damage can be caused. We, we think about, um, that, that I, I really believe that because by God's design, um, the act of sex is so intimate that it needs to happen in the context of this, this deep commitment by a man and a woman that when it, when it happens casually, that people are really damaged emotionally and spiritually. I think sometimes uh, young teenagers will, will will become sexually active at a young age and all of the, the damage that that can cause them spiritually and emotionally. Uh, I, I think of some young girls that face a lot of trauma in their life as, as a result of that. Um, when we think about the, the pain and heartache that happens when People step outside of, of marriage and, and there's um, adultery and, and, and then a lot of times divorce may follow. And if we just thought for a moment of all of the heartache and, and how many people have been just deeply wounded and hurt and experienced the pain of betrayal and how many children have been really damaged by, um, by, by divorce. And I'm not saying obviously there is grace. God's grace is available for us. None of us are perfect. But I just want to share God's plan, and I want to defend it for a moment and just say that it's a really beautiful plan when we follow God's way. And so that's kind of my opening statement here that I, I just want us to consider. Um, you know, I, the other thought that I just have is when um, it talks about in Genesis that, that the two become one, that, that when a man and woman come together in marriage, that they become one flesh, that this sexual act is, is a lot more spiritual than, than people realize. And that's why it's so important to follow God's plan because of all of the heartache that can follow um, when someone has multiple, multiple sexual partners. What is actually happening if, if the two are supposed to become one flesh and, and the spiritual significance of that? So that's a lot that I just threw out on the table. And so I'm just going to hand it over to Jeff and try to be quiet for a few moments. Okay, in verse 18, um, what jumps out at me at first is when it, where it says, flee from sexual immorality. And the footnote in my Bible says that in the Greek, that, that that's a, it suggests a continual activity. So in other words, keep on fleeing from sexual immorality. It's not something you do just one time and you're done. It's something you have to do over and over and over continual activity of fleeing. Um, we, um, there's the um, flight or fight or flight, uh, I was trying to think of that phrase. Um, maybe and sometimes it's the right thing to do to, to flee. Um, he calls us to flee here because on our own strength, we cannot fight this. Um, so it's something that we need to run from. The other thing that I see here is just um, in studying a little bit about Corinthians. Um, in Corinth, there were a lot of temples, uh, pagan temples, and they even had a temple there to um, the goddess Aphrodite, and involved in that temple in, in the city was a lot of um, prostitution as part of the worship. So just walking by the temple, you could maybe be solicited. So um, I'm sure that the, the church in Corinth was very impacted by what was going on there in the culture there. We think, you know, we think that, oh, it's never been as bad as it has been, as it is here and now. 
Well, they had it pretty bad in Corinth with, with um, prostitution actually be something that was considered worship and it was celebrated. It was con so it wasn't just tolerated, it was considered a good thing because it was part of the worship of the city. So, um, yeah, we, we think it's, it's worse than it's ever been. Maybe not, but um, they dealt with this issue. Now, I'm sure they dealt with this issue on a on a daily basis. That's pretty much what I have on it. Mm -hmm. So I had several thoughts on this, but I, actually, your your introduction brought something else to mind that sure. we hadn't discussed in advance. But um, I think it's important to point out when he talks about sinning against your own body, and then you consider all of the other passages that talk about um, a husband and wife becoming one flesh, that when you're in the situation of marriage, sexual sin, even if that sexual sin is is mental and visual, you know, we've talked about pornography or there's reading material, um, that kind of thing is not just a sin against yourself, it's a sin against the person that you've become one flesh with. So um, it's very important to see that it becomes damaging not just to you, but to the, the family unit. Hmm. Um, but some of the things that I thought of as I read this um, is it, we might want to ask the question of why is it such a big deal that we're damaging our own body? And we'll, we'll get into more of that in the other verses, but I wanted to point out that when you are pursuing any sort of physical sin, whether that's sexual sin or many of the others, I, to me, I, I kept thinking about eating issues and food issues that become something where you are using a pleasure-seeking mechanism in order to escape from dealing with uh, real emotional issues and real spiritual issues that have to be dealt with. And instead, you're sitting against your own body, damaging yourself in order to have temporary pleasure. Um, and and I, I speak as a woman who sees food as often, it's culturally acceptable, right? You, you watch a movie just as you watch these movies and it's culturally acceptable for men and women to live together without being married. It's also culturally acceptable for a woman to sit down and eat a pint of ice cream because her heart's broken. And we, yeah, we laugh about it, but it's a very real problem um, because we are seeking pleasure and, and not seeking God as the solution. And we are damaging our own physical selves. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, these types of things all lead to addictions. If, if we go down the road of sexual immorality, or if we go down the road of um, food problems, or there are many others that we could discuss, um, we're all familiar with the damage that drug and alcohol can do, uh, those kinds of things lead to addictions that become more powerful than our own physical selves. And um, that's why the verse you pointed out that the concept of fleeing is so important, because we can't dabble in this and say it's okay. These are the types of sins that consume us and become something that overpower us. And so um, hmm. we need to make sure that, that we walk away and we run away from anything that is us using pleasure or escape as a way of handling those things in life that seem too big, even if what seems too big is just that we're lonely at the moment or we're just too busy and we just don't want to deal with it or we're too tired or it's it's too hard a battle to fight. Um, when we give up like that, we open the door to destruction in our own lives. Even if that is a long road to get there, it can come. So, I appreciate that. I, I like the phrase dabble in it, right? Because I think that the enemy tries to convince us, um, you know, you don't need to jump all the way into sexual sin, but you could, you could watch this or dabble in this um, and, and with, with other temptations as well that... Mm -hmm. No, we need to flee. You know, we need to flee. I appreciated some of the things that you guys both, uh, you mentioned that at the Temple of Aphrodite, that it was actually a part of their worship. And I honestly believe that in our culture, it sort of is worshiped, right? Sex, it's like, I feel like in some people's mind, the most important thing in their world is sexual fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And they will fight for it and, and worship it. And, and again, it really will lead into pain and heartache and brokenness and emptiness. And that, that how can we convince the world around us that to walk with God is gr the greatest fulfillment? To, to know God, to walk with him, 
that we really can't find lasting fulfillment anywhere else. We, we find fulfillment in relationship with God and his mercy and his tenderness in intimacy with him in times of prayer, in times of fellowship, um, that we turn to him. Yet we want to keep turning to things like, um, you know, all of the things that Cherie hinted at, you know, that we can get caught up in all of these things that are, are so shallow, you know, when, when God's right there, like um, he, he wants us to, to find fulfillment in him. And, um, you know, I'm troubled, I'm burdened by that that cultural reality, that um, th the idea that there is nothing more important in my world than sexual fulfillment, that is a lie from the devil. But I'm telling you, a lot of people in our world believe that. And, um, you know, I, I, we, we as the church need to communicate a better message uh, because a lot of people are being deceived. And we have to guard our own hearts because the enemy wants to deceive us as well. And a lot of times people in the church end up believing similar things. And, uh, and so, you know, God has something much better for us than sexual sin. He just does. Um, other, other thoughts here? Um, well, let me read verse 19. There's plenty more to get to here, and, and we'll have opportunities. But let's read 19 and 20. Um, so verse 19 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Jeff, what do you see here? What do you, what do you want to share? Um, when it says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, I think, I think I used to think of that as, okay, you need to be holy. You need to keep your body holy and be careful about what you, be careful about what you do. And that's true. But there's a flip side to this, and it's good, it's good news, that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So he's here, he's in us, he's with us, he's in us. So we have him to fight these battles for us. We don't have to do it all on our own, because we may not be powerful. We may, we may not be strong enough to, to stand up to some of these things on our own, but he is. He is powerful. He he can do it so you know it's there's hope here it's not all you know negative it's not just saying you know, bad boy um behave yourself there's a lot more hope than that when it says you know the holy spirit's with you he's in you that's empowering yet you know in a different way because it's not we're not the ones with the power he is yeah i i agree that's one of the things that i strongly noticed this time around when I was reading this, just that um, God's power is present to fight with us. Um, I, I think some of the, the other things that I see have to do with uh, recognizing that when we're bought with a price, our physical selves are not our own. We tend to live our lives in a way that we think, well, my spirit belongs to God, right? I need to cure myself of jealousy and envy. So I need to start spending time with God and allowing um, him to change me so that I, I no longer deal with these these wicked emotions. And then we treat our body like it's ours. It doesn't belong to him. But this very clearly says, glorify God in your body and your spirit, both of which are God's. So what choices that we make with our bodies are just as important as those choices that we make about um, our attitudes. And we're supposed to be bringing both of those under submission to God. And I think when we make the choice to treat our body as our own, we're disrespecting, um, we're disrespecting our creator and, and we're disrespecting the one who has the power over life and death. Um, I, it's not one of the verses that we talked about. Um, you know, it's not one of the ones that we're reading out loud here, but verse 14 of chapter six, says that God's raised Christ from the dead and he's also going to raise us from the dead. So he has this ultimate power over our bodies that gives us um, the strength, his strength will fight our sins or you know, fight our temptations for us, but also um, he's, he's the master, he's the Lord. And we are, I guess, faithless and disrespectful when we choose to take it back and say, this is mine, I'll do with it what I want to do with it. But it's it's a very uh, 
countercultural thing to say your body is not your own. Right. It's it's not a popular message. No. But <laughs> it's true if we are in Christ because obviously he paid the price for us on the cross. Right. But it's not something that people want to hear necessarily. And I think the church needs to do a better job of speaking the truth, but also in a way that's hopeful. Yeah. Again, there's hope here. There is hope. Because as you said, he's the one with ultimate power over, over our bodies. He's going to resurrect them someday. There's hope here. It's yeah. not all bad. It's not, it's not bad. It's good. But it's totally upside down from the way the world looks at things. Well, it is. And, and uh, Pastor, you said something that I wanted to tie back in. You mentioned, you know, God has something better for us. I think the lie that we're fed and the reason that our culture pursues this personal sexual fulfillment as more important than anything else is that we tend to think that that's some sort of ultimate pleasure and intimacy, that that's all there is. But, but that's the lie. The lie is that that's the most important thing because What's most important is that we have intimacy with the Lord and we feel loved and um, welcomed and forgiven by Him. And if we're not seeking out that personal intimacy with Him, we're going to have a void. Even as Christians, if we're not actively pursuing that relationship with God, that there will be there'll be moments when there are gaps and voids and loneliness, and and we'll try to fill it with something else. And culture pops up with this ready answer as to what that thing is but Paul valued time with God so much that he said I wish everybody could just be unmarried like I was so so there's something to be said about that intimacy and that joy that uh, when we choose to make our body our own and our attitudes and you know when we withdraw from that intimacy we're missing something we think we're gaining something but but we're not. We're, we're listening to a lie that clouds us to the true joy of a connection with God. Thank you, guys. So I would just add, I think we're almost ready to actually move into Psalm 32. We're doing better than I thought. Um, <laughs> friends, I just want to say, so there are there are two messages here. The first is God's standard is high, and we, we're going to be held accountable um, to that. And he's telling us a couple things that are really important here. He's telling us to, to flee from sexual immorality. We're called to flee from that. And, and that's something that we, so, so there are times we need to flee. There are times we need to fight. Um, you know, speaking as a, as a man, I know that for Christian men, that sexual temptation is a very real thing. And so we do have to fight it and we do have to flee it. And, and so I would just uh, encourage you to know that, that the, the word says that we need to flee um, we're also told here to honor God with our bodies, that there is a responsibility. And, and so I, I just want to encourage all of us that we can't listen to all the lies of the culture. We need to tune the culture out, pull ourselves back away from the influence of the culture. And, and we need to allow God's word to speak to us. But he's telling us to honor, our, honor him with our bodies and to flee sexual immorality. So on one hand, um, I really want us to hear that together. I do. And then the second thing that I want you to understand is that uh, regardless of the sin that maybe you are caught up in or failures of the past or what you're experiencing right now, that God loves you and there is hope and there is forgiveness and there is healing and he can help you kind of break out of, of whatever place that you may be in right now. And so we'll, we'll deal with that more as I get ready to read Psalm 32. But, but in other words, we, we want to share God's standard and his expectations with you clearly. But we also want you to understand that, that there really is hope and he loves you and, and he's willing to help you work out of whatever mess you may have gotten yourself into. And, uh, and he wants to walk with you and bring healing. And, and there is grace. There's grace and there's help and there's hope. So we're going to move in, into Psalm 32 now, but before I read it, uh, we just need to be reminded quickly of the background. King David, who was considered a, such a godly man, a man after God's own heart, and we, we see he wrote so many of the passionate psalms. We, he, we know that he loved to worship the Lord, had, had a very intimate relationship with him, yet he fell terribly 
um, his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and all, all of the, the hurt that, that he caused her personally uh, with, with how her husband was handled and sent to the battlefield. I, I think most of us are aware of the story. But King David uh, rebelled and sinned sexually, and it hurt a whole lot of people. And uh, it was a mess. Yet here in Psalm 32, we this is King David writing this, and this is a psalm that speaks about um, how God brought healing to him through confession of his sins, through repentance, how God brought healing to him uh, by forgiving him of his sin. And so we want you to understand that as I read this, this is written by a man who sinned sexually in, in a, a pretty significant way that caused a lot of people a lot of heartache. So let me share these verses with you. Psalm 32, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So, there's some clear simple truth here and i've got a few thoughts to share um i i would one of you want to open up and kind of jump in here or do you want me to start um i can um where it says um blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered um it reminds me of when adam and eve fell in the garden of eden and sinned um they were ashamed of their because of their nakedness and god provided a covering they tried to cover for themselves they took fig leaves i guess and tried to fashion some kind of clothing and cover themselves but they couldn't adequately cover themselves so god took the the skins of animals and made clothes for them basically he covered um their nakedness and so i think really that's symbolic of they felt shame and they needed covering. And so, and it actually, it points towards Jesus' blood on the cross that covers us and that's our ultimate hope. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, sexual sin brings a lot of shame. And because of that shame, then people won't reach out for help and they won't talk about it. They won't reach out and get the help they could get. And so um, God, but God has a solution. He wants to cover our sin and cover our shame. And um, we don't have to live in that shame. And yet many people do for years and years, maybe basically their whole life, they live in that shame that they, they're so ashamed that they can't reach out to anyone and get the help they could get but but god will does he has a solution he he wants to cover us that's good i um i i kind of latch on to verse three which i i happen to be reading out of king james right now so it might sound a little weird but you know when i when i kept silence my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long and it's talking about how by not confessing sins the shame of it, the, the guilt of it all just, it, it broke him. Like physically he felt weak and sick. It, it wasn't just a spiritual thing. It was just as the sin was also physical, so was the shame of it. And I think it's important to note that, that his process here is recognizing that it was a sin and admitting it was a sin in the first place, but then coming to this point of saying, not only am I mentally accepting that this was wrong, but I, I'm, I'm broken in it. it. Body and soul, I hurt for, because I have sinned against myself and against God and against others. And uh, that broken spirit is always what comes first in that journey towards wholeness later. And, and he says that this was brought to him by God. Day and night, 
thy hand was heavy upon me. So God was, God was the one bringing that conviction of sin to him. And he, if, if he'd ignored it, it probably would have destroyed him. Instead, he recognized that God had brought this to him and then he was able to confess it to him. And then he was able to, you know, verse five, acknowledge his sin and not hide it from God, admit it. And that's where the victory came in. So there was this process that said, I'm going to, I'm going to know it's a sin and I'm going to be broken before God and convicted of the sin. And then I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it to God. I'm going to admit it and be open about it instead of hiding it and pretending it doesn't exist. Uh, it was that process that brought him to victory. And and I, I do this a lot, but the rest of the, the chapter is important. Um, so if you're reading on your own, certainly look at it. I just want to point out that, that you get to the rest of of the chapter and, and he talks about um, victoriousness, about how God is his hiding place and he preserves him and, um, and he's glad in the Lord and he rejoices. So he starts out with this really broken place and he ends up in this place of victory and the process required confession and honesty before God. Good. Thank you. I, I want to spend a few moments and talk to uh, Christian men. And so statistics will tell us that a lot of Christian men battle lust and specifically pornography. And so I just want to kind of speak openly about that because uh, I think there are Christian men that are just struggling and hurting, and they're feeling exactly what he's talking about, that, that heaviness, that pain, that they're, they're, they're battling um, the, this, this pull toward, toward pornography, and, uh, and they're feeling the shame and the weight and the heaviness and the guilt and the burden of that, and that's an awful way to live. And, and we don't want that for you. I want to say a couple things that we do understand that we're in a real battle. Uh, that there's, I've heard somebody teach on this that talked about if you're a, a, just, just how accessible pornography is now in our day and age that almost everybody has a smartphone in our culture from practically age 13 and up, it seems. And I, I heard someone teach about it that basically said, hey, if I'm a cocaine addict, and on my phone, I can order up a line of cocaine anytime I want, um, you know, then I'm, I'm not going to be very successful. And so I think the accessibility is a challenge that not only has our generation had to battle, unlike any generation previous to us, but I think how much worse it must be for our teenagers now, for, for the kids that, are, that we're raising um, in our church how we need to protect each other and help each other. And so all of that is not to make an excuse, but it's simply to say that uh, we understand that men are battling this and we want to be able to help and support. And so there are a few things in this passage that are just important. The first is confession. Friend, if you're carrying all this and, and battling all this, the, the Bible makes it very clear that there's this call to confess. In James 5, we confess to one another. I think that um, when the Protestant Reformation came and there were many things about the Catholic Church that we felt like needed to be changed, and I'm in agreement with those things, but I, and I don't feel like we have to confess to a priest, but, but I, I feel like confession has been minimized in the Protestant Church, and we, we don't embrace it enough. And, and I want to say to you that if you are struggling and hurting and broken, um, you need to confess, and probably not only to God. You, you can confess to me. Um, but if you have a spiritually mature person of the same sex as you that you can reach out to, preferably two or three, um, then, then you need to confess and face it and deal with it. And I tell you that when you do, um, you're going to have some of these same feelings that King David had, that you're going to feel free and... Um, you're going to feel like a huge weight has just been lifted off of you. Can I jump in? Please. Um, David was in a miserable place here that he described. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. I'm like groaning all day long. Um, he was in a miserable place. I don't know how long that lasted, but um, you don't have to stay there. Um, I think sometimes 
guys especially will stay there for years and years and because they because it feels so hopeless and but the good news we're trying to say is in confession there is freedom absolutely there's freedom in confession and 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 we we can repent and that's a part of the christian life like uh, again not that we want to fail in sexual sin or any other kind of sin but sin does happen in our lives and we need to know how to deal with that and we deal with it through confession of our sin and repentance and a lot of times we need to be able to do that in community uh, friend I, I i've also heard a, a teacher who teaches on this subject say a lone sheep is a dead sheep and um the, the whole isolation thing is deadly that if you think if you've struggled with i'm just going to use i'm going to say it very clearly if you've struggled with pornography for 10 years and, and you convince yourself that you're going to overcome it on your own, um, the, the, the past 10 years would suggest that you need some help and support. And I want you to know that I'm, I have studied on this subject, and, and I, know, I, I know of resources and helps and supports. And so I guess I'm just saying if there's somebody who's watching the stream that is hurting or struggling, I, I would really love to be able to be a support to you and, uh, and, and pray with you and, and point you in, in, a, in, in the area where there are some really good resources and supports. And, and hope. There is hope. There's hope. And it, it doesn't mean, you know, if you confess and repent and, and get some support, it doesn't mean that you're going to live the rest of your life perfectly. But, but it does mean that things can be better and things can be right. different and there can be some real healing. I believe that. I just right. believe that. And, and I want that for you. And I feel like that, you know, the enemy just has a whole lot of people living right here in Psalm 32, especially probably men battling sexual temptation and, and, and maybe specifically pornography. But they're just carrying that weight and that burden. And that's an awful way to live. Nobody wants to live like that. Nobody wants to feel that condemnation and, and that weight. And, and we don't want that for you. And so I want you to know that um, confession is good and healthy and healing, and it's a part of God's plan for us. And repentance, we, we need opportunities to repent. Repentance is a, a major part of our life, that we repent, and, and we need to make it a safe place in the church to do that. I, I heard a different teacher talk about how beautiful it is in 12-step uh, meetings that people are so honest and vulnerable, and they have a, a community, and they confess every day some of them every week and so in the church we need to be able to be honest and confess and support one another and i know that this has always been an issue and a struggle probably throughout all of history i'm just simply saying technology has made things really difficult and i think it's caused men to get caught up that maybe in a hundred years ago they wouldn't they wouldn't be caught up and so there are unique challenges and battles that that men face and uh and and I really want to be a support and an encouragement. I just really do. I, I'd like to jump in and say something Please. from the other side of this, which is, you know, women may not always deal with exactly the same issues as men, but they're still dealing with stuff. Right. And, and I think speaking, you know, to other women out there, it often stems from a source of loneliness or, um, or sadness or depression. And a lot of times what women find themselves drawn to is going to be more in the reading material or the romance novels and there's a lot of there's a lot of junk out there but the the problem is that that's just as destructive and we tend to downplay that because it's maybe it's not visual material and, and we talk a lot about what men are dealing with but um, when women are dealing with something it there's they're dealing with some sort of emotional aloneness or sadness or depression and they're trying to fill it with this reading material that is going to um, actually get in the way of their ability to connect with someone else because it it replaces reality with this fakeness and I think it's um, important if women are struggling with this or uh, as I brought up kind of in our discussions before uh, sometimes it's it's not even the sexual material sometimes it's food but there can be something that you're using to fill a void um, fill that void first by going to believers and and as you pointed out go into somebody who is the same sex so seek out other women and be that you can trust and that you can be honest with and say i really am just failing in this area and and 
help me understand why and help me to feel loved and and help lead me to God in this time so that I'm not alone. And um, we, we don't need to ignore this issue as a men's only issue. We just need to know that we're dealing with it in our own way and that we do need to seek out other believers and we need to seek out God's help in this time. Um, and we need to remember that we are that we're loved, even when we don't feel like it, especially, you know, that this whole past year, I think a lot of women may feel alone in a way they never have before. So it's important to seek out those connections and to go before God and help him, ask him to help us to, to feel his presence in our lives and so that we don't fill it with the other stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Any other thought from you, Jeff? Are you good? I'm good. Okay. So just a quick recap. Um, God's desires that we will flee um, sexual immorality, that we will honor him with our bodies. Our bodies belong to God. And uh, also that, that when there is failure, that uh, rather than carry the heaviness and the burden and the shame of all that, that there is a remedy that we can confess to God. We can confess to one another. Um, we, we don't want to uh, again, a, a, a lone sheep is a dead sheep, that we don't want to do any of this in isolation, that we really need the support and encouragement of one another. But there is healing, there is hope, there is forgiveness. So I'm going to have a prayer, and uh, we're, we're just going to pray through some of that prayer today together. But I would also say, if you're hurting, you really can reach out to us. You really can. And uh, if as, as one of your pastors, if I can be a support and help you find resources and help, um, I want you to do that. I'd much rather that you reach out to me or somebody else than for you to possibly continue living with this heavy burden of shame. I don't want anybody to walk in that because it's a miserable feeling and we don't want that for you. So thank you for joining us today. On uh, I think the Lord helped us get through it, but not the easiest topic to, to, to kind of um, you know present to you today. Let's pray, friends. Lord, we lift up this issue to you today, and we know that you call us to flee sexual immorality and to honor you with our bodies. Lord, help us to hear that truth. So many lies in our culture, and uh, Lord, help us to seek your truth. Help us to live according to your plan, not the plans of this world. Lord, that they offer things that seem great in the short term, but lead to brokenness and emptiness and heartache. And Lord, it's much better to walk with you and experience the fullness of your presence and your love and your mercy and your grace and your tenderness. And so, Lord, I think about uh, for all of us in whatever area um, it may be, Lord, that, that confession could be a, a genuine part of our lives, Lord, that we would confess our sins. Lord, that we don't want anybody carrying around that heavy burden of guilt that King David was carrying around in Psalm 32. That, that you could almost hear the pain and, and the hurt in his heart. Lord, we want people to be free from that. And so, Lord, I, I would just lift up um, uh, any who, who will view this, uh, th this teaching. And, Lord, I pray that you give them the strength to confess to you and confess to somebody else. I pray that you would help them to find healing. And, uh, Lord, I pray that they, Lord, King David is also able to celebrate the joy that he has in your presence, that forgiveness is an awesome thing, that we want to repent and, and experience your wonderful forgiveness. We want to be in right relationship with you, Lord. We want to serve you well. Help us, Father. We need you. We need the strength of your Holy Spirit. Um, we, we just need your daily support. And so we lift up the church family, whoever happens to be watching this today. And we pray your blessing upon them. May they feel and experience your love and your healing. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, church. God bless you. Have a great week. And uh, hopefully we'll see you Sunday. Or you can join us on the live stream. Um, anything from you guys? Just bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>